Ladies and gentlemen, today I have the honor and privilege of interviewing the only female to have two of the top three highest grossing original music. Wait a minute, guys, I said that wrong. The only person to have two of the top three <laughs> highest grossing original musical comedies ever. Guys, that's right, I'm interviewing Kay Cannon, a hero of mine, and I can't wait, so stay tuned. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin yes listeners and viewers you know that this is the bella barden version of the barden bellas version of party in the usa yeah. from pitch perfect which Kay cannon wrote Aww. she's here in studio here we go wait for it okay <laughs> okay, we're so excited to have you. Thank you for being here today. I, oh my gosh, I love it. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> good, it's going to be the best. This is a good zone for me as an interviewer, and it's a good place for you to yeah, be. So yeah. we're excited to be here. She's not alone, though. I'm surrounded by two of my closest friends and amazing interviewers, Roxy Stryer. Say hi. I will say hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> and Miss Ashley Grace Daniels. Hello, hello. Um, okay, guys, so I am very excited to be here today. <laughs> no way. I know. I, you couldn't tell. I didn't tell. sense that. Um, I mentioned this was a good zone for me as an interviewer. I will say 30 Rock is probably my favorite show of all time. I was the musical director of my a cappella group in college, so there's just a lot of good reasons for me to be here with you today. Um, but we have a lot to talk about. Of course, the reason you're here is because you just directed Blockers, mm -hmm. um, huge NBC studio comedy from this year that all of us really loved. You guys have seen it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hilarious. We started together. We were cracking up. The yeah. Time. It was awesome. That um, is true. Yes, you took me. Thank yeah, you. I, I, took me. I did. We went to a press screening of it, and you know when the press are laughing that it's actually a funny movie because they don't want to laugh at anything. That is true. So that everybody true. was like cackling. I was like, wow. Yeah. I would get reports after press screenings of how it went and they I would get a lot of that they were laughing really hard and I'm like, okay, good. That means yeah. that you're solid. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I, we're here to talk about today. Just so you guys know, Blockers is actually coming out for your own on-demand consumption. It's coming out digitally on June 19th and on Blu-ray on July 3rd. Yeah. So right before July 4th, yeah. I would say that's perfect family fireworks. viewing. Just an app, a weekend of fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So make sure you guys get that. I can't tell you enough how wonderful of a movie this is. Oh, thank you. We have a lot of reasons to talk about why it's so great. Um, I think it's a very kind of special and unique version of what's a traditional studio comedy. And there's a lot of reasons that I think both the writing and your directorial hand make the movie what it is. Um, so I say we go ahead and talk about it right now. One of the things I was most interested in with Blockers K was that you were directing material you didn't write. And mm -hmm. so I'm interested in why that choice and why directing in general. Well, I was like really feeling like I was ready to direct, but I, uh, I'll be perfectly honest, I was like afraid to do it because I never went to school for it. And I, I thought I was, I really kind of honor education and this idea that you need to like have a degree in the thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, writing felt organic because I was, you know, a theater English major. Like I felt like that, that all made sense. And so uh, Nathan Kahane at Good Universe, now at Lionsgate, he, uh, we went out to lunch one day and he was like, aren't you tired of um, other people directing your own material? Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, yeah, you know what? I am tired. <laughs> <laughs> like having really thought about it. And he was like, you, you know, like, you really sort of like, and, and my agents too, they were like, you should direct, you should direct. And I've been on sets for years and I, you know, I'm an actor, a producer. And when you're a writer on television, I was a showrunner of a show called Girl Boss. It's like, you're the director of the directors. Like I, I was like, I was ready. Mm -hmm. And then Point Grey, which is Seth Rogen and um, Evan Goldberg's company and uh, Good Universe, they sent me uh, what used to be called The Pact. They sent me the script with an, a straight offer to direct. So when I read, read it and I related to the themes of the movie, I, was, I just felt like it was just serendipitous. I just felt like so fortunate that like this thing that I didn't write uh, spoke to me and I knew I had a take on it and I knew what I would do to it and I, mm -hmm. you know, I knew how I would rewrite it and I knew how like uh, how, the kind of story that I wanted to tell which is so is why it all happened that way. A straight yeah. offer for a first time director yeah. is really unique. Why do you feel like they had the confidence in you to direct this? Was it this specific script they feel like your voice was just right for it? Or were they just like yeah this girl's got it. Any script she could direct. I think it's a combination of, the, of those things but uh I you know I didn't know it at the time. I actually didn't even know it till after the movie came out, and I heard an interview with um, Seth and Evan, where they talked about um, when they did Neighbors Two, they had a um, writers' roundtable just full of women. 
that they invited because it's about Neighbors 2 is about sorority rising and <laughs> it's about sorority gals and um, there was a bunch of dudes who were writing that script and they were like oh we should bring in women who might actually know about this take notes guys that does not happen enough in this town yeah. so I love that they did that yeah so yeah. I showed up and anytime I take a job I am super prepared and, um, you know, like just coming from television and, you know, coming from 30 Rock, like it was such an education. And so I, I came in and I I just gave my thoughts and my opinions and I, you know, really laid it out there. And then I guess I didn't, again, didn't know this, but I guess when I left the room, they were like, she should direct something for mm -hmm. us. Like I would proven myself in that, like it was an audition I didn't even know I was having. Mm -hmm. So the thing I love about wow. Blockers, and I think it seems consistent with all of your work, is that obviously it's a comedy first, it's hilarious, it's joke driven, but there is this very tangible heart and like mm -hmm. a, I think a huge commitment to, yeah, just a, a heart beneath every all the jokes that are happening. Is that an important part of you, you as an artist, do you feel? It is, yeah. It's like, it's always so weird to like be like, an artist when yeah. you're a comedy person? Yeah. An artiste. <laughs> an artiste. Yeah. Get used to if it, If I have girl. any kind of philosophy, you guys. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, because I think that there's so much out there that people can watch that if you're not moving people, you know, then what, what are we doing it for, mm -hmm. in a way? And I think we laugh and cry on the same day. And uh, I feel like, I, I guess that's who I am too. It's not that I sit around laughing and crying all the time, you guys. But it's like, but uh, <laughs> I'm I'm fine. <laughs> no, really, guys, guys she's fine. She's fine. fine. She's fine. Um, no, but but I do think I do think that that happens. To, the, the the basic human condition is that we might something at work. You guys might you know be cackling over, and then you go home and have a very intense conversation with your husband or something like you know right. like, you know like where uh, where there's a lot of emotion. So. Uh, I do try to put that in everything that I do mm -hmm. and um, try to get people to feel something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm wondering on set how that kind of manifested because you're alternating between scenes where it's in the trailer, so I'm not giving away. No, but totally, yeah. John Cena is butt chugging. Yeah, and then you're yeah. going to a scene where three teenagers. Very emotional. Girls, very, very emotional. Yeah, that's the chugging. serious scene. I would be emotional <laughs> if I was butt it's chugging. It's true, yeah. Just throwing that out there. I'd be crying, yeah. yeah. Um, but then we go to a scene where three teenage girls are coming into their own and learning who they mm -hmm. are. And how do you like navigate that as a director? It's not yeah, easy. It, it, no, it was a little tricky, and you find that balance, and you know, like you test the movie. You, have to, you know, you basically you shoot everything and then you come into post and when you're editing the movie and you're like, okay, what do I have? Like, what is the story there that I'm I'm really trying to tell? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I think you you just find that balance and you trim things and you cut things and you just you just want to make sure that you got as much as you you know Me. could get from it. And yeah, and so and then when you test it in front of an audience, you go like, I, I wanted them laughing like, and I feel we were successful with this. Like, I wanted a like a laugh per like. 20 seconds you know like uh and and certainly like the producers and the fil other filmmakers like they wanted that too and then i think they were surprised by and i was a little too by how emotional it got um because uh like the scene there's a scene um uh where the one father played by ike Barinholtz is, is having a really emotional scene with his daughter and I cry like every time mm -hmm. I watch it. And I've seen it a gazillion times. I was there, you know, I shot it. Um, but I, I don't, I wasn't until, I think because we started in such a grounded place and such a real place that like people really felt it. And you could kind of go off and be crazy because you started in a grounded place. Well, that grounded part that you're speaking of is a question that especially us women growing up, we all had to face, which is when, yeah. when and how should I lose my virginity? It's a very mm. universal question. And I'm curious because I know that you have a kid is yeah. that something that when you're making this film are you thinking all right I can relate as a mom so I know exactly like how I'm gonna raise my kid when this question comes up or is it more I remember going through this and what yeah. my family told me well initially it was definitely like when I read the script my daughter was two she's now four and a half so you're um, not quite thinking about but, it yet. <laughs> but, I, but I kind of but I was in a way because I think it, it's like your your parenting philosophy starts at the beginning. Like like how you are as a parent probably doesn't change that much as they get older. And who I am with my daughter is I'm very much like you know tell me everything. I'm here for you. Like um, uh, I'm sure I'll create some boundaries, but I want her to be able to tell me whatever she wants. And then I thought about what how it was for me. And I grew up in a pretty strict Catholic home. My mother's amazing, real goofball, but like we never talked about 
sex. We never. It was abstinence, and that was it. End of conversation. I'm from the so, Midwest, so yeah, you you understand. Really, yes. right? And I'm Catholic. I can also understand. <laughs> right? Well, I grew yes. up Jewish, and all, everybody has sex at a very young age. So I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum there. Yeah. Yep. And now we've all talked about our. Well, sex by the history. way, Catholics have sex at a very young age. Very too. young, actually. Yep. And they do very weird things. It's for another Good conversation. For you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I went to an all-girls Catholic school. Many stories. There's yeah. a movie there, I think. There yeah. actually, yeah. we should yeah. talk after yeah, yeah, yeah. this. Yeah. So they told you just no. You know, it was up. just known. You know, like anything I learned, I'm the fifth of seven kids. I learned from my siblings, but they also didn't know anything either. And I had, you know, three older brothers who weren't going to talk to me about it. So I just learned from my friends and I didn't want it to be that way for my daughter. I don't want it to be that way for my daughter. And, um, and I do think time goes really fast and it'll be like a blink of an eye and then I'll be dealing with this kind of stuff. But I've, I've been saying like, I want her to like be able to talk to me, but in my mind, all the stories are like really pleasant. <laughs> you know, they're like, mom, I have a crush on this boy, or whatever, yeah. or, or girl or whatever she wants, you know. But, uh, but then I don't know how I'll be if it's something like, Tragic. <laughs> or I deem tragic. Is there any case scenario in which your version of the birds and the bees conversation is sitting your daughter down to watch this movie and you're like, and, and now the doors are open for questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a really good question. I wonder if I could do, like, a, she would never want to do this, but, like, you know, start her with, like, Pitch Perfect, where it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, this is fun. This is time to be with your girlfriends and have a good time. Yes. And then, like, when she's old enough, be like, okay, now watch Blockers. Like, yeah. I think she can learn. She can learn from movies I do. Well, one of the things I love that you've talked about in other interviews is how, as a once, you know, as a once teenager, you can totally identify with their journey. Yeah. But as a now mom, you can totally under, uh, identify with the women, the f moms in the movie, too. Absolutely, So yeah. for those of you listening, first of all, that's a good reason for you to see the movie. I think moms, dads, you will really deeply relate to this. And as a younger version of the demo that's seeing your movie, yeah. I related to both as well, and I'd love to hear you kind of speak on that. Well, you know what's interesting is, you know, because like in the trailer you see that it's a rated R comedy and you see the butt chugging, and I think maybe <laughs> there's like a lot of women who who might think, who might dismiss this movie as not for them, when in fact women love this movie, and and this is, this is like, when we, again, when we did the testing, it was like 97% of women, like over the age of 25, were like, this movie is amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, and I hope they find it, and I'm excited for it to come out um, you know, digitally so that they can do that. Um, and I think, you know, in the movie we have every single perspective. We have two moms of the two of two of the daughters in question who one is like, this is double standard, why are you doing this? And the other one's like, I'll worry about society tomorrow. You know, like, yeah. I'm just worried about my daughter. And like, I think there's just, there's just something for everybody. There's a way in in this movie for every person, mm -hmm. regardless of age or gender. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just to remind you guys, that's June 19th digital, July 3rd Blu-ray. Make sure you pick up the movie. Did you yeah. have something, Rox? Well, I, I just think it's interesting how non-judgmental I felt this direction was on these characters. And you just described two completely opposing opinions of moms. Mm. Was there ever a moment you caught yourself on set judging one of mm. the characters? Or did you just look at them like, okay, I understand your point of view? Yeah, no, I, it was that. It was I understood the point of view. Like that scene that I was talking about in particular, I was like really... Um, I really wanted that scene to be in the movie. There was talk of it not being in the movie. You know, like there was a rewrite of the scene at some point, and I just really held strong on that because I, I just feel like everybody has, for all for like these really altruistic reasons, uh, you know, have their point of view for for a specific reason to protect and love their daughters, even if the ideas are antiquated. Um, or in my mind, are antiquated. So I, because you know, the world is. Um, is dangerous and you get the, why you know a father would want to protect um their daughter and at the same time as a as a woman who was a who is someone's daughter i was you know bummed that uh there was a double standard or mm -hmm. that you know like i had a curfew my brother didn't you know like there that kind of stuff um so i i just feel like everybody's everybody's thoughts on this are valid and I, I didn't really feel like there's even room to judge and may have even had those opinions of my own at some point like well yeah, yeah. i think parenting is one sphere where it's really you know what like it's one of the most complicated and nuanced things that anyone will ever encounter yeah. in their life i'm sure because if there's like a let's say there's like a you know a teenage girl who's like shall we say loose Mm -hmm. um, in a good way. Whatever. In a good way. And That's then, what we always add after. In, like, yeah. in a good way. Yeah. It's like under the sheets. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. In a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
um, let's say something you know were to happen to her that is bad, the, you would uh, the parents would feel responsible, yeah, or, uh, responsibility to that, right? And then if you're too strict and something happens because you're too strict, the parents will feel a responsibility to that, right? So it's like you just do the best you can. <laughs> yeah, and that's what your you know? movie gets at yeah. so well. So again, I can't stress enough for anyone watching, whether you're old or young, male or female, you've directed the rare studio comedy that I think Aww, is for everyone. Thanks. So I would really recommend you guys pick up this movie. One more time, guys. That's digital on the 19th and Blu-ray on July 3rd, just in time for the holiday. So yeah, check that out. Yeah, with fireworks. With fireworks. I know you mentioned this during the other interview that you did with Maria Menounos on her Series uh -huh. XM show, which you can get on demand. But I'm going to ask you again because it was a great answer. You were... You had really captured the way, not only, I, I don't know if they're millennials, what's the next generation Gen Z. down? Gen Z. You really captured oh, that yeah. Gen Z oh, yeah, essence yeah. with mm. the texting and the way they speak to each other. Um, and you had mentioned that you got some you would, you got some advice from your niece, I believe, or from your yeah, family well, member? I, well, I talked to my niece at the time. She was 15, and right. I was just like, you know, like, it was like, what are the kids saying? <laughs> what are the kids <laughs> doing? Conversation. Right. And um, and she has a very open uh, you know, like dialogue with her parents, with my brother and um, sister-in-law. And so she was just saying, like, all, she was just telling everything to me about what's going on in high school and, like, <laughs> what she's going through and, you know, all the different kind of secret accounts on Instagram and the whole thing. And I was just, like, wide-eyed and, like, oh, my goodness, what's happening? I'm so glad I wasn't in high school when this is happening. What now? <laughs> right. Uh, but, yeah, like, just trying to make sure that it was, like, uh, as true as possible. And now I think you'll, you know, a year from now or two years from now, you'll hopefully it'll age well, but you'll look back at blockers and be like, remember when we had emojis? <laughs> like, when we're going to be going like this and yeah. exactly. doing stuff with our eyeballs? Yeah. <laughs> Did your niece see the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, uh, she came out with... Um, my brother and you know, the whole family came out on opening weekend, and we went um, theater hopping on, on that oh first Friday. And it was so great because I've been, what I want from, I wanted to make people laugh with this movie. And I think I Mission accomplished. accomplished. That. Yes. Yes. Um, and I also want to bridge this communication gap because mm. I, I feel like, you know, in our attempt to become real equals in our society, us ladies, it's just like we have to start to be treated as though we're not damsels in distress and that we have power and a voice. And so I would love to bridge that communication gap really between daughters and their dads in a lot of ways. And um, when we were theater hopping, my niece was like, Dad, I think there is a double standard. <laughs> no <laughs> and way. they start having this conversation. Oh and, and and her brother, uh, Jack, who's only a year younger than her, was like, no, there isn't. And my brother was like, no, there isn't. And then she had to really like wow. find her voice. And she's like, there is. You do this. And then they started talking about, she said, like, well, what what about, what will happen when I decide to lose my virginity? I mean, I'm in the car. I'm like, what? Oh my gosh! Like this is, but it was so awesome because they were actually wow. having a conversation about like like a real conversation about it that I love so much. And I was like, this is what I hope is happening. Well, secretly, in, he in was probably way. happy yeah. because he was like, yeah. I mean, she hasn't lost it yet. Yeah, okay. exactly. I can have this conversation. I think he knew. Oh, so my gosh! <laughs> and he's uh, my, my sister-in-law, Michelle. Uh, they're like a wonderful couple. They've been married. They're, they were high school sweethearts. So there's that that whole other element too, where it's like he's like, well, you know, I'm married to your mom <laughs> and we, we like kind of like his only girlfriend he's ever had. Yeah. <laughs> well I just think I the that. way the, th the way the movie can balance those scenes with comedy and still be a light movie it's just it's to me one of the movies of the year and I oh, loved it you. and I can't wait for you guys to see it as well if you haven't one more time guys June 19th and July 3rd <laughs> Uh, digital and Blu-ray. Okay, so as a comedy nerd, one of the things I love to ask <laughs> comedians is, what do you feel like when you were young were some of the like major touchstones for the formation of your kind of comic voice? Like a lot of people say mm -hmm. SNL, a lot of people yeah, will reference yeah. a sitcom. Do you have anything you can point to? Um, yeah, well definitely SNL was, was huge. Who was me. your cast, do you feel? Um, Dana Carvey. Mm. Um, but then also Sherry O'Terry. Yeah. Uh, the Sherry O'Terry, Molly Shannon, um, Maya and um, uh, who am I forgetting uh, she plays Martha Stewart oh uh, right Anna uh, Gaston Anna Gaston yeah. thank you yeah like that girl. and then like Tina and Amy you know like that like that, that sort of power when the ladies really became powerful on that show I think mm -hmm. like when Tina became a head writer and, and stuff like that like that but 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 as in my youth I would say like certainly Dana, the Dana Carvey mm -hmm. era I just thought he was the funniest person and I actually got to meet him 
um, at an SNL after party, uh, you know, like years ago or whatever, and I, I pretty much lost my mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't relate to that like, at all, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is going to sound really weird because I'm, I'm a huge John Hughes fan, and um, so, like, Breakfast Club and, yes. um, you know, Pretty in Pink, and uh, but, but Weird Science... Mm. Like, Weird Science, I thought it was so funny. Underrated. <laughs> like, I was like, this is hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, like, Weird Science, and then, of course, like, Jim Carrey was, like, you know, huge at probably a pretty impressionable time in mm-hmm. my life. I had a big um, six-foot cardboard cutout of him as the <laughs> no mask way. in my room for a long time. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, like, it's... I don't know, like the like Steve Martin was yeah. was influential to me in a lot of ways. Um, certainly Gilda Radner, um, uh, but yeah, you, but I'll tell you, my um, my parents like we. I grew up in a small town and you know was raised on television and with pride was raised on television. And my parents would sit us like kids, probably to babysit us, but would put us in front of the television to watch sitcoms mm-hmm. and they had really good taste and i remember my mom saying like like uh, they didn't know about ratings or whatever but she was just like si- this show seinfeld is great <laughs> like remember wow. that first yeah. year of seinfeld like they were like was it going to be canceled and right. they no didn't have the ratings it. and no one was watching it yeah. whatever and so she's like you got to keep watching it and she was like that with cheers too she was like this show is great and so and i was probably too young to really appreciate how great cheers was at the time but like but we would, you know, we would just watch comedies like as a family every night or wow. whatever on Thursday nights, which, you know, was the big thing. Um, yeah. Tina talks about you and your childhood in Bossy Pants. She says, your success at the show is a testament to why all parents should make their daughters pursue team sports instead of pageants. <laughs> Do you agree with that statement? Do you feel yes, like that's an absolutely. encapsulation? <laughs> so you were an athlete growing <laughs> totally. up. Totally. Okay, yeah. nice. Do you feel like that informs your writing and your kind of comic yes. style? In, yeah. In what well, ways? Well, it, it definitely informs a work ethic because I think, um, like, I can, uh, you know, write for long periods of time without fatiguing and... Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of have that mentality. You got to you know, get it till it's perfect, till it's right. You just re- you rewrite, you rewrite, you rewrite. Um, so in that way, and then I, I just was on a lot of team, spo- you know, teams in which I was like the captain of the team or whatever. And so you, like you learn like leadership skills, and you're around a bunch of different personalities. So mm. you're absorbing all of that in terms of comedy. And then when you like, I'm an improviser, so that's in a weird and and I would equate a cappella in this too. It's like oh, yeah. it's a weird it's a different kind of weird sport. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, where like you kind of there's inherently Im- improv is not competitive, but there'll be like, you know, herald competitions. Or the, the, there's like some competing that goes on in the improv world. Oh, and, yeah. um, but you, so you learn to play. It's about learning to play and yes, anding and making the other person look better than you. Mm. Um, uh, so I feel like all those things helped. And I, but being in sports, you're just like out of trouble. What, you know, that you, is you true. stay out of trouble. And there's statistics on that. But what do you do in two years, three years, however many years, your daughter comes to you and says, Mom, I don't want to play sports. I want to be a pageant girl. Yeah, it's going to be a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Wolf just had a quote on her new Netflix show where she says, Being a woman is complicated because I want women to feel like they can do whatever they want to do. I just wish that pageants wasn't what they wanted to do. <laughs> totally. I do. I wish that too. Yeah. I just wish it was like you know just something else yeah but <laughs> yeah. miss usa just yeah. did remove the swimsuit, swimsuit component right. to their show which but, I think is but a lot of ladies are upset by that right. yeah, yeah. They're like i've too. worked really hard yeah. to uh have this physique and right. i want to be able to use it yeah yeah super interesting stuff mm-hmm. well i would be remiss one thing i do want to ask you quickly before we move on to 30 rock is you did boom chicago and amsterdam uh-huh. and at least in my head as a comedy nerd i just like have such a mythic view of like what this is like seth meyers was there yeah. can you talk about your experience in amsterdam totally. and i I just want to hear about it. Also, uh, Boom Chicago <laughs> yeah. celebrating their 25th anniversary, awesome. and, and so in uh, like a month, I'll be there uh, with everybody. Uh, we're all going. So Ike Barinholtz and Jordan Peele and Seth nice. Myers and the whole. There's a, there's plenty of wonderful uh, people who are all coming together. So are you on a group text about it? Uh, uh, no, not really. No, but <laughs> I can awesome. just imagine yeah. that chain. All emojis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, when I went, I had never flown in a plane by myself. My first flight to was to Europe was by myself. And I had never lived by myself. So imagine, like, like you get this apartment in Amsterdam. And so for me, there was a lot of, like, sort of coming of age for me, I guess, when I was there. And then when I was there, uh, I was there with Ike and Jordan and Nicole Parker um, wow. um, and... Uh, uh, 
uh, Becky Drysdale, who's this great writer, and then at the end of my time there, Joe Kelly came in. Mm. He's a, a this great writer. There's just like a, a really bunch of fun people, but it was, they were just so talented. Um, and uh, and I and so you were doing this show where people don't speak English as their first language. So you learned how to be really confident because you were performing all the time in front of people who didn't speak, you know, who, who you know, they, I guess they, they did speak English, but they mostly, you know, they were, their native language is Dutch, and then you've got all these tourists and everything like that. And then I was in charge of the corporate shows, so I would go, and I've, like, done shows in caves, in <laughs> castles, uh, and I did a show in Cyprus where um, they delivered togas that fit to that fit you uh, to your hotel room, and after we did our show and had dinner, we all had to put togas on, <laughs> and uh, and then I was like, I remember being thrown into the water uh, into the pool at this like five star hotel at like four in the morning by Russians that were like, throw the American girl in <laughs> <laughs> with your toga. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> like crazy parties. Yeah. And then I'm a total drug loser, and there's like drugs that were you know, like. Uh, yeah, so it was this. I it was like I was super green. I was super young, and it was just a great place to learn, and a great place to fail. Yeah, because you weren't like failing in front of you know people in America that might not give you a job in the right. in the future. You could kind of like sort of figure it out and go back with all this confidence. So, I mean, I'd love to see that movie. Anytime somebody doesn't laugh at your joke too, you're like they just didn't understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't me. It was them. Language barrier. Yeah, yeah. 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 I just love said that. it louder. Yeah. <laughs> what a good louder until they laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm the biggest 30 Rock fan in the world, so I feel like we'd be remiss not to talk about that. I know you guys love the show too. Yeah, of course. Um, um, it got me through mono in college. Oh my and god! Like, yeah, and I, I do feel like when we point <laughs> wow. to comedy touchstones, it kept you awake. Every kept, joke. Oh my gosh! Kept you, kept and we, when we talk oh. about comedy touchstones, like it is one for me. Like when I look mm. at shows that have kind of informed the comedy I love and really respect, like that show is huge for me. And you talked a lot about Thirty Rock, but one thing I'd be super curious about is like if you look at that writers' room, it was mm -hmm. you obviously, Donald Glover who created Atlanta, Robert Carlock who and everything else and everything <laughs> else. And he's having an okay year. Yeah. Huh? Um, Robert Carlock who co-created Kimmy Schmidt, Tracy Wakefield who created Great News, Jack Burdett, Last Man Standing, Paul Pell who wrote Sisters. I mean, this room I would just have oh. to imagine it was just the deepest bench. Yeah. And I'd love to hear about how the room kind of operated because Thirty Rock. I mean, it's generally regarded as one of the best comedies of all time. So I'd love to hear you speak on just that room specifically. Well, that uh, that first room, especially, or you know, the first year where it was, because also on the on that list would be John Regi, mm -hmm. who created uh, the show American Woman that's coming out, and uh, as well as a bunch of other shows he wrote on uh, the Larry Sanders show, um, and then uh, Matt Hubbard, who has got a show that's coming out. On, on Amazon, who, who won a couple of Emmys for writing individual episodes of 30 Rock. Like, just amazing. So you've got John, Matt, Jack Burdett, Donald Glover and I were the rookies, um, uh, Brett Bear and Dave Finkel, who, uh, who show ran um, New Girl, mm -hmm. were executive producers on New Girl. So it was intense. And then you've got Tina at the head table and you've got Robert Carlock. And, um, and I remember the first couple of weeks because I had never, I was the first. Was, I had never written any, you know. I had written some samples and stuff like that, but I never. This was my first job, and I remembered thinking like I was just having this constant like inner, um, you know, dialogue where I was just like, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm getting a paycheck. I can't believe like you know, I'd go to the bank and I'd I like deposit it. And I was like, hope I'm here next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they were just started, They were just talking about their lives for the first couple of weeks because you know, like Tina's life being on SNL, it's like so intertwined with. The show 30 Rock. Right. So it was really just telling stories. And, you know, I come from sketch and improv, so I could, like, you know, give to those stories. And I remember thinking, like, this is awesome. If you were just sitting around talking about our lives, like, I can do this all day. Like, this is great. And then the writing happened. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like, actual writing. I was yeah. like, oh, this is very, very hard. <laughs> And uh, and it was just, like, it was like a, you know, a, a grad school for comedy writing. Just watching, I learned how to break story. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to create characters that are interesting and, and funny and different and just different joke structures, you mm -hmm. know? It was really great. How did you know when to participate and uh -huh. when you were overstepping? Because I think that's very hard when you're in your first room and you are 
the person that's newest on the team when you are the greenest person in there. Yeah. It's hard to know when to speak up and when to stay quiet. And there was a lot of like Harvard uh, writers um, there too. So like sometimes like Donald and I would write down words that we didn't know the definition of, <laughs> and, and then we would go back to our office. We shared an office and it'd be like, well, what does this word mean? And then we would look it up and we'd just like tell each other. Um, that's amazing. That's awesome. But you know, but Donald and I were came from improv, so we were we were used to playing and um, contributing in that way. Like we were, like brought a lot of like fun and energy to the room. And then you had like sort of cerebral, heady writers who could who could write comedy like nobody else. And um, so that mixture was really nice. So to answer your question, it's like you would just. You, you you were I, you would try to be quiet but then when you felt like you could infuse fun or you know like bring you know make people feel relaxed or something like that just be really playful um, uh, that was that was really helpful because as staff writers that's your job is to sort of like support those that are actually doing it and learn mm -hmm. um, and so and I would write things down and and you know if you'd pitch something and everybody would look down <laughs> and be like yeah, <laughs> and then you were just like, okay, let it go, let it go. Yeah, <laughs> it helps from being uh, from such a big family because I am used to a table full of people talking and knowing when to contribute and when not to. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. A lot of our listeners are industry aspirees, and mm -hmm. one thing you've talked about in interviews is how you viewed yourself as a performer preceding Thirty Rock. Yeah. And you sort of had to do a bit of a mental identity shift to really own yourself as a writer. I, I personally feel like that's great advice for people who want to enter the industry is like say yes and take jobs that you can but I'd love to hear you sort of speak on that process and sort of that journey that you made. Yeah I mean I, I don't know it was I just sort of rode the horse in the direction it was going you mm -hmm. know like I, I at, 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 when 30 Rock happened I was so desperate for a job I had tested for Saturday Night Live I did not get it obviously uh, <laughs> uh, but I, and I was feeling really like oh my gosh what is what it's gonna happen to me again I'm a school person like I have a, a master's in education you know like I'm like I I'm not used to this I'm not used to I'm not used to being unemployed for this long or whatever so I just felt like it was okay I I, I you know and at 30 Rock you didn't know if you're gonna get picked up mm -hmm. like for a long like every year it felt like even like halfway through the season you'd be like oh are we coming back are we not coming back there was a time in that first season where we definitely felt like we were going to get canceled and not get a back nine. Um, so I just, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm still a performer. This is just something I'm doing temporarily. Hmm. And then, and then pitch, and then I started, then I sold Pitch Perfect and it was like, no, no, now I'm writing. I, I don't, but I still, I guess I still in my head, I still do think of myself as a performer, although no one else does, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that helps me <laughs> in, in a way. <laughs> well, writing is performance, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, just it in a helps different... in, in my writing. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to perform? Is that something we'll see from you? Or? Yeah, you know, I mean, I still do improv shows. Uh, I did it for a long time when I was doing Girl Boss and then directing the movie, but now I'm back to doing um, improv shows and... Uh, um, I did like an independent movie. I just did a small thing in, in uh, my husband's show called Alone Together. Um, so, Which I love that show. Uh, I know, it's so it's funny. So right? funny. It's so funny. Yeah, Esther's uh, really brilliant. Yeah, I think, but yeah, yeah, yeah. She's great. Um, so, I, you know, whenever I can, like, I, had Girl Boss come back for a second season, I would have written myself into the show. Okay. But, uh, but it didn't, and so it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in here. <laughs> <laughs> something tells me you're going to get my another chance come true. to yeah. write yourself yeah. into something. I'm totally. Sure, yeah. Um, well, we should move on to Pitch Perfect now because I know our fans will be dying to hear you speak on this <laughs> this franchise. Oh my goodness. Pitch Perfect is not a small thing. I mean, like... Mm -hmm. Oh I, boy, no. Yeah. I mean, you were talking about John Hughes. It's funny. I think of John Hughes as having written the teen movies for a certain generation. I think Tina wrote really the teen movie kind of of our generation, which is mm -hmm. Mean Girls, of course. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think Gen Z is like, Pitch Perfect, like, it's their teen movie. Like, I kind of view you as their John Hughes in that uh -huh. way. Um, can you speak on just this franchise blew up? Like, what was that like? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Like, I, when, at the premiere of the first movie, I remember being interviewed and someone bringing up a second, like, uh, what, what, what if there's going to be, like, a Pitch Perfect 2? And I was like, you bite your tongue. That's crazy. Because <laughs> I couldn't even believe that I was there at the premiere of Pitch Perfect. Like, I, I couldn't even believe that it was, like, coming out. And um, in my mind, I had just made a comedy with music in it. You know, like, uh, I didn't think of it, at, I don't know, I, I in my head I had it a, a different way. Yeah. And that it caught on the way it did, or like had, 
you know, I, I was stealing straight from Bring It On with <laughs> like with, with in terms of like Aka what or Aka believe it, you know, like putting Aka in front, like creating their own language. Yeah. Like I was really just taking it from Bring It On, <laughs> which awesome. I think is an amazingly funny and yes. awesome um, so good uh, movie and. So I just, I don't know, like I, I just can't believe what's happened with it in a lot of ways. And when I got the call that there would be a second one, I remember feeling like I was going to throw up and... Uh, in a good way? <laughs> um, in a, well, I just knew it. <laughs> not, I don't know. <laughs> like in a way of like, oh, there's so much work involved to like, you, I didn't want to ruin it, you know? Mm. And, um, and so I, when, when Pitch Perfect 2 did as well as it did, I, I just... It was it was such a great feeling. I actually like Instagram myself like dancing in the streets about how happy I was about how well it did that opening weekend. It's so fun. Yeah. Um, as an acapella veteran and still, you know, I still do it. You you nailed it. Were you it. offended by? Okay. No no no. That's what I was gonna say. I had actually read the Mickey Rapkin book Pitch Perfect. You did? I was like, yeah, one of the before small, the movie before came the movie. Out? Yeah, it was like required reading for our acapella group. Um, Your which, acapella group had oh so required much. reading? Oh, yeah. What was the name Just of Just checking. Group? We were originally called the Cheesies. <laughs> to brand, to rebrand, we became Open Fifth, because that's much cooler. Oh, you were Open Fifth. What yeah. school? Uh, Miami University in okay. Oxford, Ohio. So, oh, yeah. So, which so is not university, but yeah. Yeah, and then there's, there's multiple. No, whatever. I get it. Yeah. I think we use that as a joke at Second City. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you did. There's a sketch about that, yeah. Well, we're, it's a great school, guys. It's awesome. <laughs> we're real. Um, um, but I, you nailed it, and which I again like when you're writing a community, you do have a responsibility mm -hmm. to get that community right, and like just the tone and like the unserious self seriousness. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, like right. can you talk about like how did you get that so right? Well, well, because again, this goes back to like it's very similar to the improv community mm -hmm. because we will do shows for free, and then you have a coach. And then the coach gives you notes after your show that you've just did for free. <laughs> and it's intense. It's yeah. like you're really trying to learn how to do this. And a lot of, you know, a lot of improvisers that do this, the big schools like Second City or Groundlings or whatever, they become famous. Like there's like, there feels like there's all these stakes, but you take it so serious. <laughs> and people date each other and people marry each other within the community. And the community is like this really tight knit group of like hundreds of people. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I, I took it from that. And then I went to, um, Mickey Rapkin's, uh, book launch. Like he had like a book party mm -hmm. and, a group. Oh my gosh, I forgot their names now. I might a know group them. out of New York. Okay. Um, what school? The, you the NY Harmonics, maybe or something yeah, that's like right. that. Yeah. Um, they performed, and they were performing like, at, like, like, uh, like you guys are them, and mm -hmm. we're listening to them. This is how close they performed. Wow. wow. Right. And so there was a, a girl. Like I was sort of watching how they were performing, and there was a girl. Like if you were the the singer. And she was singing um, "Proud Mary," and she was touching herself, <laughs> like while you know, while she was doing it. And I was like, "That's a character that mm -hmm. was, became Stacy." Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then I talked to them afterwards, and I was like, "So I'm, you know." And then of course, like now, Pitch Perfect is what it is. But then it was like so foreign. Like, who are you? And right. you're writing a movie about what? But they immediately were like the tone you see in the movie is like the tone that they were where i was like okay do you guys ever have any like battles where you sing back and forth to each other and then this one girl goes you mean a riff off oh my god and i was like yeah that's exactly what i mean oh that's so awesome yeah. i love it i love oh my it god. did you ever get in touch with them after the movie came out they're, I, they're well, like she stole our line because um you know kelly jackal was in an acapella group. she was in my sorority in, in college oh, we're was. friends she's so sweet she's yeah, amazing yeah what a great voice Voice too, and I think Out she was on world. the sing off too. Yeah, wasn't she's, she? she's killing it. Yeah, Doing yeah. Well. So I would ask her, and I would ask the like Ben Bram. I would ask yeah, him. Deke like, Sharon like, was there. Deke, yeah. I interviewed him. You guys can check that out. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I would I would ask them about like you know tell me about tell me give me stories of your group or whatever like that. I did, did a lot of research, mm -hmm. uh, asking those these kind of questions, and then the, their answers are pretty funny. Right. Yeah. For sure. I mean, it's such a ridiculous, but self-serious, but earnest and fun-loving yeah. community. And I'm just, I'm so glad that not only the mo the movies became as big as they did, but that you got it right. Because it would have been frustrating as like an earnest acapella lover to see you get it wrong and for the movies to get as big as they did. So uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. your research is appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, Rox, you had some questions that I'd love for you to dive into. And, and, well, first of all, also, I don't think 
it would have gotten as big of as, as it did if you hadn't gotten it right. So was there ever a time where you were like, I am risking putting something in here that is not genuine, but I need the laugh, and you decided to <laughs> put it in there or throw it away? I, mean, I can't think of anything, but of course, you know, like Jason Moore, who directed the first one, like really, you know, he captured the tone so so great, you know, like, and I don't know, I'm sure there are jokes that are, that are on the cutting room floor that probably for good reason yeah. <laughs> that didn't that didn't make it I think you know I, I didn't really have as much to do with the third one I wrote the um, the first couple of drafts of it but then it, it was I, I, I equate the Pitch Perfect movies as like Pitch Perfect was my baby Pitch Perfect 2 is like my teenager that was like really hard work and I was really trying to like make sure <laughs> I got right and then like Pitch 3 is like the adult kid who never calls mom <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's how I felt like Pitch 3 was like I had like nothing to do with it <laughs> like, oh I was God. doing blockers or whatever right. and so I don't know like if there's anything in there that would feel you know not authentic or something but uh, I think that um, Jason and and the producers and, every, and the actors and everybody in the first one just did such a great job of like capturing what was on the page and a lot of times for screenwriters you don't get like you can, you'll write something especially a studio movie it'll go and then it's what you end up watching is nothing that was like what was the intention right. on the page, and I felt. What do like, you do in that scenario? I mean, you're you're not you're not the one, you know. You try to, to direct your own stuff, I guess. Yeah. Is what you would do, like a, a cash that check, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and then have another idea. But like, I really felt like when I saw the first time I saw Pitch Perfect, I went in uh, to post with um, Jason had invited me and my husband. Um, to watch it and I think I just didn't like breathe for like two hours I mean obviously I was breathing but I was just like like having like this I was just like hanging like white knuckling watching the whole thing because it's like it was so crazy I was like oh I've got a movie I wrote and this is what it is and it is what is on the page like it was how I envisioned it it is how you know I thought it would be and it made me cry at the end uh -huh. and you know and it's like a tribute to Breakfast Club and, yeah. um, and oh, then I don't God. know if you noticed I'm sure you didn't but in Blockers um, in Julie's room, I put up a, a like below, so you can't really see it because I didn't want to be all braggy. But there's a Pitch Perfect poster. Oh, is there? Because I felt like she is uh -huh. like she would have grown up on Pitch right. Perfect. Yeah, that's her generation. <laughs> also, it was yeah. a Universal movie, so it was very easy. To yes, put, to put on there and get <laughs> approval for it. Uh, but yeah, like, it's true. I mean, <laughs> it, it has become, I think, an iconic franchise like sort of a touchstone so yeah. I want to congratulate you and just thank you for getting it right thank you yeah. you know it was like the the best thing ever I feel like is this this idea of like you know song music is very uplifting it makes people feel really good but I got this video of these kids like 12 year old boys in Dublin getting out of like Catholic school oh. or whatever they're in their uniforms and they're just singing cups like <laughs> in the streets of Dublin like without a care in the world and you know that kind of stuff makes me feel really good. So cool. So yeah. cute. Is yeah. uh, that the next step for you? Because you talked about obviously wanting to direct the movies and that yeah, getting yeah. more is writing and directing one movie. That is your next yeah, goal? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, possibly having a role in it for yourself? Uh, as well? I don't know about that because I feel like I'd have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, right now I'm writing something that I hope I get to direct, I hope gets made. and. Well, you announced you some know, news but... this morning that might help ha make that happen, what? right? K and J or K and L. Can we talk oh, about? Oh yeah, this? yeah, yeah. Last yeah. night, we, yeah. Um, so um, Laverne McKinnon and I, who she's the executive producer on Girl Boss, and and you know when we met each other, both creatively and personally, we just like fell in love with each other, and um, we have a production company uh, called K and L Productions, and and um, we're doing both TV and film, and we're trying to like. You know, make people laugh and Great. make people cry, and um, just like and and mentor people and try to you know just do a lot of good work wow. as much as we can. That's yeah. awesome. Did, did you, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, did you have a mentor growing up? Um, I I think like Tina Fey was, is you know been a real mentor to me, and then good and mentor. then prior to yeah. that, like I swear every single teacher I had uh, growing up was was really so great to me and you know like being from a small town in fact my um track coach and health teacher is like staying at my house right now oh my wow. god that's awesome <laughs> and wow. uh that, you know that's how like we've stayed in touch and and um i just feel i just felt really supported growing up
Wow. That's great. With this production company, do you think that you are going to focus on creating your own work and that's where it starts and stops? Or are you looking no, for... No, we're every, like we're creating a slate that has everything. Like, you know, stuff that I'm co-creating or writing or and then directing or, you know, like, and then stuff that I'm just producing and that we're, you know, guiding uh, people. So What motivated you to want to start a production company? That's a massive undertaking. No, yeah, it really is. And I don't I, mean that to scare No, no. <laughs> Maybe I should She's fine. Know. She's fine. Yeah, She's fine. fine. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I just feel like I, you know, like Laverne and I talk about all the time, like, and 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 also Irene Marquette is uh, someone who um, she's like right over there. You guys can't see her, hey. but uh, she is we also can. like our, our, you know, our third in our um, our triangle of trying to move, touch, and inspire people. Uh, it's just just feels like the next thing to do. Like we want to be able to. Um, we work hard, and we mm -hmm. have a bit, pretty big bandwidth, and we're incredibly ambitious, and we just like really want to go for it and and create content that we really love and believe in. Yeah. Um, so we have a huge wrestling contingency at our network. Oh, so yeah. I'm sure they'll be interested in just the John Cena of it all. Uh -huh. I'd love to hear, you worked with John Cena closely, and Rox, you have a little bit of, on this too. I know you follow wrestling. Yeah, well actually right now filming next door to us for some insider baseball for you guys at home is X-Pac, who is a massive wrestling star. He taped a show here, and uh, so talk about the fans. They're obsessed with John yeah. Cena, and they follow him from the wrestling world to things like blockers. Maybe they wouldn't have necessarily seen it. So what was it like with him on set? Could you tell that he had been trained different from other actors because of his wrestling background? Well, you know, the the wrestling background for him, I feel like John is a performer, and he understands story. And he, he actually has a very, he has a high comedy IQ. And when you're an athlete and you're about to do something like his next, you know, role what as as Mitchell in Blockers like he worked really he he treated it like he was an athlete working on this role like he did he did his homework mm. he was always super prepared he knew his lines he, he anything I anything as you can tell from the trailer I asked him to do he did <laughs> and and he really like like he comes from from it from like sort of this like improv kind of world uh because like the wrestling world is a performance is mm. is like it's it's athlete you know athleticism meets um you know meets arts. the circus yeah. you know like okay. uh, or the circus. In, a, in, in a way you know like where it's like and you're going to make sure that every person sitting in front watching you is being entertained and is is there with you and i just i mean i would work with john cena for i would do anything like he's so great and he was just really a pleasure that's and amazing he's so talented. to hear. Yeah. Another thing that, of course, is coming up all over the news right now with John Cena is the Nikki Bella relationship, which was on again, off again, on again right yeah. now. Did she ever visit set? Did you ever get a chance to meet her? Or? Um, I didn't meet her until the premiere oh. of uh, of of Blockers because uh, uh, they're both so incredibly busy. You know, I mean, like she was so incredibly busy. I, I didn't yeah. ask too many questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kept that. Also, John is very much like. He'd call me coach on uh, set. No, he'd like, he'd like coach, so get everything you need, coach. You know, like that, I love that kind that. of stuff. That that's seems so him. That's great. <laughs> well, we're running out of time, but we do have a game that we'd love to play. Mm, okay, um, right. So Ashley's going to take the right. take the reins here. We're good okay. at games, right, Kay? We've yeah. got no, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please say this is easier than the, the last one we oh, did yeah. together. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> so in this game, we've comprised some quotes, um, and they More are quotes. quotes that you have written. Oh, my so gosh. So we want to know if you can guess uh, if it's a character that you wrote for or if it's a real person. So oh. some of them you've written, some of oh, them you have. This is so haven't. exciting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. some of them you haven't. Sorry. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we already messed up the game. <laughs> Meaning I did. Okay. All right, so first one. I don't know if she wants to be me or skin me and wear me like last year's Versace. Did Jenna Maroney say this or did Dina Manzo from The Real Housewives of New Jersey? Oh. Oh my goodness. Okay, give it. <laughs> yes. Give it to me. I don't know if she wants to wear me like. I'm going to say Jenna Maroney said that. No. no. Dana Manzo. No. <laughs> One of the housewives. Oh, Rhoda Housewife, essentially. <laughs> Oh my gosh. 30 rocks tough that? because I don't know if I wrote, like, the, the jokes could have been written by anyone. <laughs> okay. 
Get your head out of your ass. It's not a hat. Okay, that is uh, one of my characters. That's yeah. Aubrey. Yep. Yes. I knew yeah. I had to say. Yeah, exactly. It sounded kind of Trumpian, so we wondered if that might be something he would say. But yeah, yeah. Aubrey or Trump. Oh, All boy. right. Tonight's the night we celebrate our bodies and out mind. And I think you meant to say our minds. I did okay. mean to say our okay. minds. Okay. So let's start again. Tonight's the night we celebrate our bodies and our minds. Did Tracy Jordan Black Tie say this or Tony Robbins? Tracy Jordan in Black Tie. In Black Tie. Or Tony in, in the episode, the episode called episode Black Tie. Wrote, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, wait. What did Tracy do in that episode? Because that was where we had Gerhardt. Uh, thank you for coming to my birthday. Wow, you have a great um, night. I mean, this is like a long time ago. Yeah. This is like, uh, uh, I'm going to say... Uh, Tracy said it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's talking to Pete Although, Hornberger. Tony yeah. Robbins so right. could say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He probably has at some point. He oh stole it from Tracy. The best customer service is if the customer doesn't need to call you or talk to you. It just works. Did <laughs> Jeff Bezos say this or Jack Donaghy? No, uh, Jeff Bezos. Yeah, so that's yep. Jeff Bezos. You were yep. so certain yep. about yeah. that yeah. one. You're like, that's my not Jack funny. would not say that. <laughs> that's not even a joke. <laughs> All right. I'd really like to start calling you Shorty in public. <laughs> <laughs> Robin Thicke or Schmidt? Schmidt. Yeah. <laughs> it's bringing back memories of when it was like written. Yeah. Last but not least, you are psychotic, Jesus Jugs. Did Angie Jordan say this or Tamara Judge from Tamara Judge says yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I swear. Because I also memorize everything that the Real Housewives say. Wait, you do? Oh, we uh, have to bring yes, you in for yeah. the Real Housewives after shows here. Oh, my goodness. Are you a big I fan? Could, oh, yes. I'm yes, obsessed, yes, too. Okay. Yeah, it's really What's your fun. favorite? Everybody. Um, my favorite is favorite franchise. It's a split between New York and Atlanta. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Really? Mine's My New favorite York. is okay. Dor Dorinda. Dorinda's and, uh, amazing. Yeah. Have you ever met any of them? Yes, I've been. We've had every New York Housewife here. I'm yeah. obsessed. Like, Wait, who have best. you met? Uh, so I met Kyle Richards yes. at uh, an Emmy party years ago. Did you go up to her? I met, uh, yo, yeah. <laughs> and, and I went up to her and I said, um, how is uh, Taylor doing? Oh, because no. Because it was after, yeah. 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 <laughs> and she told me. She was she like, did. she's not doing well. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Good, good. Thank you for letting me Any know. other Housewives <laughs> encounters? I did yoga with Lisa Rinna. I did yes. not talk to her. Although in the yoga class, they were like, introduce yourself to the person next to you. And she was too far away. I wanted to be like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um and then um i was at a lakers game with um uh vicky gumbelson and no. her whole family and so okay you have oh to my understand god. my husband could care less and he like he leaves the room if i have it on and he thinks me a worse person when i want <laughs> and and we walk into we, we had gotten like tickets like some vit peak kind of nonsense that we don't ever get so don't think <laughs> awesome. that i get that often sure that's um, but we but we walk in and it's like the whole family it's like vicky her boyfriend no uh, wait what, boyfriend at the time was it um, the, the one now right oh steve. the new one steve no, okay, not okay. brooke okay, okay. okay. but like so it's steve it's a, and i i see her children first and i'm and i like stop in my tracks i'm like <gasps> no a housewife is here. <laughs> you knew it. You're a real diehard. Also, wow. I have to tell you this story. We shot Blockers in Atlanta, and I had I rented a house, and I'd only seen it, uh, the house, uh, you know, the pictures um, uh, online or whatever. And I had only been to Atlanta for, like, pre-production, like, in and out or whatever, but I haven't really been to Atlanta uh, proper. And so it's, like, early in the morning, I, I fly in. Uh, to move there to, sh to shoot the movie and the sun is like barely up I had my eyes closed and I open it and I get to like East Atlanta and and I, I stop and I'm like I've been here <gasps> I know I know this no. neighborhood and it's because of where Cynthia Bailey, Cynthia Bailey used to live are you kidding me? <laughs> So you thought you were actually like I've been here. Yeah, you're been like, you've I'm watched like, it. I know. That's I know amazing. all of these. I know all of these houses. Oh, that's Sweet. So awesome. That's amazing. You have to come and do a recap, please. That yeah, we'll make that happen. You'll have a blast. Ashley yeah, knows more about it. housewives than anyone I know, and it's, it's it is okay. an art. It's a science. It's like there's it this a whole. Science. It's, yeah, it yeah. Is, it we gotta Harvard. get involved, Jeff. We gotta. I know. Get involved. I'm like, what am I missing? I need to get on the train. Um, that being said, what is next for you, Kay? Obviously, mm -hmm. Blockers, such a wonderful movie, guys. I can't tell you enough how much you need to see this movie. But what else? Um, so uh, we have a slate for the production company, and um, and then I'm writing a movie for Sony, and um, uh, yeah, I'm just just kind of like more of the same, like just trying to 
awesome. get, get stuff done. Write, produce, direct, <laughs> yeah, yeah. star and things, you yes. know, just the, the casual <laughs> Tuesday. Just trying to keep working. Well, we cover everything here, so when your new stuff comes out, you know we'll have it here. We'd love to have you back. If you guys go into our archives, we have coverage of every Girl Boss episode, and we covered Blockers in, in Anatomy of a Movie, which is on our sister oh, network, yeah, yeah, the Popcorn yeah, yeah. Talk. Yeah. So we love you here, and we cannot thank you enough for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank yes. you so, so much. great. Thank Good. you. Good. Um, all right, guys, we got to get out of here, but before we do, my name is Jeff. If you guys want to find me online, you can do that at Jeffrey C. Graham. This has been Spotlight On, where we highlight some of Hollywood's biggest above-the-line talent, directors, writers, showrunners, actors. I'm not alone. I'm surrounded by a group of brilliant co-panelists, including Ashley Daniels. Hello. You can find me on Instagram at Miss Ashley Daniels and Twitter at Ashley Daniels. I'm everywhere at Roxy Stryer. And Kay Cannon, where can they find you online if they want to tell you how much they love Blockers? Uh, go to KK Cannon. K-A-Y, K-A-Y Cannon. Nice. I love it. All right, guys. This has been Spotlight On. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time here at After Buzz TV. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later! The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 